Thanks, Todd. Um, Todd. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Hi, this is David Pinsky with uh, Hitachi. I'm filling in for uh, uh, Shima san who's uh, traveling today. Okay. Welcome. So on the agenda today, we have uh, Hackfest planning, um, another refresher on the internship program, which is accepting applications. Um, we have a draft of the requirements working group charter to review. We've got a proposal to um, to, to start a new project around the <clears throat> a Go SDK client for the Fabric. Um, we've got the Fabric Composer proposal, um, Sawtooth uh, demo net from Dan, and then follow-up Q&A on GSL. Um, are there any other agenda items? It's a pretty packed agenda. If not, then I think we should get going, Todd, on the Hackfest planning, and then hopefully we'll achieve quorum before we have to vote on stuff. All right, sounds good. Uh, I'll move quickly through these. Uh, for the April Hackfest, we are still looking at the week of April 24th, East Coast. Uh, we have been talking with a few companies that can potentially host. Uh, unfortunately, those haven't panned out. Uh, if anyone on the line uh, has venue space in their office uh, that could potentially work, please get in touch with me ASAP. Uh, otherwise, our events team is exploring paid space. We're hopeful to get something locked down by tomorrow, uh, but it could be early next week. Uh, from there, uh, in June would be the next next Hackfest. Uh, there's a couple things going on there that we're looking to tie together. Uh, LinuxCon China will be having its first year in Beijing, June 19th and 20th. We will be having a Hyperledger track there. Uh, looking at uh, likely having a Hackfest run concurrent to that. Uh, as well as doing a hackathon uh, over the weekend prior, June 17th and 18th. Um, um, any questions uh, there or uh, initial feedback? I'm sorry, so you're looking for a location in China? Uh, sorry, the, hackathon? The, the location we're just looking for uh, in the week of April 24th on the East Coast uh, could be New York, Boston, or any of the surrounding areas. Okay. And that's during the week? Uh, during the week would be preferable, yeah. Uh, so we'd be looking for two I days. Even, I think we could even extend it to Chicago or Washington, D.C. as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, if no comments there, we'll we'll continue exploring behind the scenes. Um, any questions? Uh, please get in touch as soon as possible. Um, yeah. So, Todd, um, I, I know that there is uh, another um, recent member who potentially has some space in Boston, um, but not the week of the twenty fourth. Um, is there any possibility of changing the date? Uh, there is. Um, based on the feedback we got, it was pretty strong that people wanted to get together the week of April 24th. I think the week okay. before was um, the the second best for folks. Uh, otherwise, we'd be looking at pushing a, a week later, which, you know, not ideal, but still possible. Right. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll connect you... Um, and then we could, you know, if if the dates could be flexible, then we might be able to do something in Boston. Okay. Um, how many people do we have to host? Uh, it's typically around seventy-five. I think the most we've seen is around ninety. Uh, fewest is around fifty, fifty-five. Okay. All right. All right. Internship. Yep. Internship program. Uh, just a oh, question. So actually. I on on the the Hackfest and um, Hackathon and Linux Con in China, um, Brian, you want to just sort of say a couple of words? I mean, I think we really do want to try and get a, a critical mass of the TSC uh, in China, um, and uh, and and maybe you know you want to talk a little bit about what we were thinking about for that. I know you posted the mail. Yeah, list, but sure. So. 
so this was partly inspired by you know what was uh, by, all, by many accounts a successful hackathon, but one that probably we felt what could be more specifically about um, the core code on the projects um, or potentially building sample applications uh, that would also be good additions to the repository. Um, you know, in some ways it kind of became a business plan competition more than a, than a hackathon, um, which I think is very normal for, for China, but um, what I what Chris and I talked about um, was uh, was the potential of steering it very much back towards the idea of a competition um, between teams who would be brought up the learning curve on a given hyperledger platform and then um, tasked with tackling you know bite size you know good beginner bugs in the issue tracker uh, or small to do items um, things that are you know sharp edges that could be rounded off the kinds of things that are good first time developer activities. And then at the end of the weekend, basically the teams would be evaluated on kind of a subjective sense of, you know, who got the most done. Um, there wouldn't be any obligation to upstream and accept patches during those two days, but the idea is during the next two days at the Hack Fest, uh, we'd get developers together to actually evaluate what had been done by all the teams and see if we can main mainstream them in. Um, so very developer focused, but it really only works if we have a nice critical mass of core developers on, you know, a number of the different projects. And so, um, I, and I don't have to hopefully make the pitch for China and just the way that it's growing there. And I think the strategic importance of us being there. Um, um, I do know it's it's a bit of a haul, but um, I'm sure if there's questions about visas and other things, we could get that answered. Um, but if we started planning now, my hope is that we could get a reasonable contingent out there for it. But I really want to hear from the rest of the TSC if that's something that they they buy into as well. Don't all speak at once. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't want to put anybody. anybody on the spot, but I think, you know, people, I, I think I'd like people to consider um, the ask and, uh, you know, maybe ask your, your, you know, your management chains about the travel and so forth and your significant others. Um, but I, I do think it would be worthwhile to get us all together um, in China for that event. I know Brian does it. And I think, you know, the notion of having sort of a bug squashing, um, you know, type <laughs> would be a, a good thing for all the project. I'd also invite you all to submit uh, talks for the um, for the uh, track, the Hyperledger related track that'll happen at LinuxCon Asia. That'll happen concurrent to the Hackfest, um, and hopefully we'll get a space just right next door for the Hackfest to to LinuxCon itself. But that could be another another uh, pull to come out um, and participate. Okay. Um, Next up is the internship program, Todd. Yeah, just a quick note there. Uh, so we will close um, the call for uh, applications at the end of next week. Uh, so please share this out to your networks, um, and I'll include a link for how to apply in the minutes that go out. That's that. OK, and Senator Bawa, you're saying that the internship program cannot be applied from China? Why is that? I'm not aware of that. I, I, I can answer that, Chris. Yeah, um, yeah I, heard, I heard that. I, I can answer that. So um, there is a, I'm sorry, Bawa. Oh, go ahead. Um, so there is a law that was passed um, that became into effect at the beginning of January that makes it complicated for um, uh, U.S.-based nonprofits, including consortia like us, to operate in China. Um, we work with that law and and uh, deal with it wherever we can. Um, right now, we don't have a way to do the internship thing through that um, uh, around that law. Really, um, we are looking at some possibilities, but we just can't commit right now um, to having interns in China because of that. So it's not our choice, not about resources. Um, and it may get addressed, but um, not in time for, likely not in time for us to be able to choose China-based students. Um, oh. There's a small chance, and we're going to keep, tr we'll keep trying. All right, that sucks. So Todd, this, it's currently restricted just to China-based students. Is that correct? 
for the internship program? Uh, there, there may be another country or two randomly that we can't can't work with. Um, you know, North North Korea, for example, but um, it's pretty wide open. Okay, but we only have one project, isn't it, that we would need to source within um, with, with students um, for China? Is it just one project? And I think there would be what, what sort of response will we get into the applications? Um, uh, have any been submitted for the China project yet? Um, I'll, I'll need to go look. We have had a decent number of applications. We have no geographic barriers in that someone has to work in the same city or same country where the project mentor is. This is completely virtual. Um, so that shouldn't be too much of a limiting factor for folks. Okay, that's good. Thanks. All right. Okay, um, that's unfortunate, but let's move on. So next up is a requirements work for the charter draft. Is Ole gone? Sorry, can I just one uh, question on the internship? Yep, go ahead, Dan. Um, so I, I started routing people who have been uh, querying me to that link that you provided, Todd. I'm not sure what the, the hiring process is going to look like or the selection process. So I, I assume that when people reach out to us, we're supposed to give them uh, clarifications on the, the project proposal, but that it's the Linux Foundation's decision process for uh, who is selected. Uh, yeah, and we'll definitely involve the mentors in that. This is not something we're doing, you know, behind closed doors by any means. Um, so right. we'll, we'll, we'll kick that off at the end of, uh, after this closes on the 24th. Um, but yeah, any logistics questions, um, whatnot, please just direct them back to us. Okay, and so you set a date there for, for when decision processes start? So, so the call for applications closes on March 24th, uh, so Friday of next week. Um, and then uh, we will work through the that all the following week. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. So I don't see Oleg on. Is Oleg on the call? Anyone else in the requirements group that can defend, if you will, the the charter draft? If not, we can we can bump it. We have t tons of stuff on the agenda. All right, I suggest we bump it, Todd. Let's um, let's right. move to the uh, go uh, proposal from um, Secure Key. Alexander, are you on? Hi there, uh, Troy and Alex are here from Secure hey. Key. Okay. So. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's review the proposal. And this is the link, Todd, in the chat. Yes. Uh, and if either of you uh, would like to be made presenter, let me know. Um, otherwise, please take it off. Yeah, I don't have the uh, go to meeting or what we're using open. So I guess if we just go through the doc, it would probably be the easiest. OK. All right, so how, how do you guys want to work this? Well, I think it, you don't have to go through line by line and point by point, but maybe just sort of um, outline okay. what the proposal is. And um, uh, in particular, I think, you know, focusing on, um, uh, you know, the resources that um, are going to be uh, working on that, and, um, uh, and then we can have a discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So um, there's there's two major points in this proposal. Um, one of the points is to have a Go-based um, uh, client for Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and the second point is about extensions to the uh, specification, uh, also written in Go. Um, the purpose of the extensions is to, uh, for example, allow um, the peer to actually create tr transactions itself, so to allow a peer to, to itself be a client. So in the reference tickets, um, uh, as, as examples of this, uh, there, there are several features that would have to be part of a Go-based SDK to enable that kind of functionality. So this, this proposal is really about both enabling a, a proper Go-based client and also these extensions to allow, um, uh, allow the peer to uh, also act as a client. 
Um, there's a couple other things in here as well that we referenced, which was um, we, we also put a proposal out there about um, 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 other forms of, of certificates where the client could potentially uh, make its own kind of T-certs. Uh, so we're, 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 we're trying to say here there's a, there's a proposal for the Go SDK, there's a proposal for the peer to act as a client, and also a discussion on other um, potential features in um, Fabric-based clients. Um, did, did that motivation make sense so far? Yep. Okay. Um, do you guys want to pause for discussion on, the, on that or keep going? Are there any comments, concerns, questions from the peanut gallery? All right, keep going. Sorry, right, Chris, okay. I was just gonna struggle to come off mute. I just wanted to add it. Oh, you know, I, I support the uh, notion of a Go SDK, um, especially if we can get everything refactored, you know, the CLI and whatnot refactored. I would say one comment about the uh, T-cert changes, I would suggest that, you know, whatever's being proposed there be worked through the SDK working group because you would probably want Unity on, on the other platforms as well. Yeah. Also the identity working group, please. Yeah, yeah, so um, um, that, that those particular uh, um, things, particularly the T-cert change, um, should go through the various groups. Um, it was just making a comment in here that to actually support um, um, those kind of uh, T-certs that you'd have to actually change the, uh, the client SDKs. So it, it was just kind of a related point that, that um, we've been thinking about and working on. Um, um, but certainly something like that, as it changes the peer itself, uh, has, has a larger discussion to be had. Yep. Uh, anything else? Okay, so, um, and then, so in terms of the resources, um, Typically, sure, so. one of the things that we look for is, um, and I should have taken time to look at this, but um, one of the requirements of a proposal is to identify who the maintainers would be of the new project. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I know, you know, there was a little bit of discussion in uh, in the mailing list. I think you know Brian suggesting that we should, you know, treat these SDKs as sort of independent projects, um, and uh, so I think I think that that makes a certain degree of sense, and uh, so one of the things that we will want to do before we actually approve this is get um, the names of who would be the maintainers and and who would be the um, uh, the contributors to the project going forward. Uh, sure. So uh, on on that point, so uh, as as stated in the proposal, we'll contribute our initial code base. Um, the link to the current code base is at uh, at GitHub, and in the in this document, uh, Secure Key itself is continuing to um, work on on this code. So certainly, uh, we would we would like secure some Secure Key people to to be part of the maintainer list, um, as as we're continuing to put effort into this. Do we do we have a difference between sponsors and maintainers? I mean, I see on sponsors, you know, three from Secure Key and and two from IBM. Um, you know, a, a third sponsor from a third company may be nice, but but I consider this probably diverse enough to get started. Um, you know, as long as we focus on growing that over time. Um, uh, I, should we just should we just adopt the sponsors as maintainers? Uh, so we're we're okay with that. All right. So um, I, I just put out a note shortly before the meeting, which I'm sure nobody had a chance to read yet. But what we've done historically with SDK projects, or really generally any project that was uniquely feeding into a, an existing top-level project, was to fold that work underneath the existing top level. And I think some of the reasons for that were that 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 top-level community has kind of the best say in in the merits of, of that uh, sub work and then also there's kind of the chance of a, a profusion of, of projects that aren't 
necessarily independent because they all kind of ride on the success or or not of that top level one. So uh, from from my perspective, I think it makes more sense to to have some kind of sub project uh, where uh, where an SDK like this would would feed underneath. The the examples pointed out in in the mail as well were within Sawtooth, for example. We've got a few different SDKs, but those are all kind of underneath the, the main project. Yeah, my, my take um, is that these, um, you know, the granularity of projects is an important question, something definitely worth talking about. Um, and we shouldn't uh, overshoot. I mean, it would it'd be hard to stay on top of, you know, hundreds of modules, but we shouldn't undershoot as well. The, un the risk of having too much activity buried inside one monolithic project is, is you know, details might get lost, uh, important code coverage might be lost. Um, it might, you know, I, I think you'd end up with a situation where an SDK kind of gets maintained by one active person um, and then it becomes theirs uh, and people kind of <laughs> ignore it whereas if it's a separate project it can become clear if that project becomes moribund um, because the activity you know it's 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 a bit easier to track from a from a health and activity perspective um, and you know the the granularity should really match to a scope for a project that calls for you know something that can be kept up and maintained by six to a dozen developers. Um, um, any more than that and it just gets kind of too large, smaller, and you probably have too many. Um, so um, the, the, there's a, the question of things that start out specific to one framework and maybe over time can generalize. So like Composer is likely something that starts out with Fabric but could generalize the way that Cello has. It could even be the case that these SDKs do, but I don't want to trap that in as a requirement just yet. So um, I think I think we just go with what seems right. Uh, this this SDK probably is complex enough, and and having an independent set of maintainers probably useful enough to have it be independent. Um, and we could talk about whether the SDKs for ta Sawtooth um, should be independently promoted, or maybe as a group promoted as one project. You know, the Sawtooth SDKs project, uh, or or see if there's a way to to merge them into these SDKs. But. Uh, um, uh, I'd, I'd rather go forward and approve this than, than subclass it in. Um, and then finally, um, we do already distinguish between framework style projects and modules, um, you know, uh, uh, and uh, we could probably, you know, when we list the different projects at Hyperledger, we could probably list them differently such that Sawtooth and Fabric and Aroha stand out uh, distinctly from uh, things like the SDK projects, uh, uh, just as, as as layers of a of a of a layered cake, so to speak. Um, those are the three things in the front of my mind. But I would recommend yeah, going and, ahead and approving this. Right. So, and Brian, I tend to agree with that. And, and I would note that also the current set of SDKs that we have, aside from the Node SDK, which was part of the original Fabric, um, are all independent projects in the sense that they have. Um, uh, an, uh, a different set of maintainers um, uh, based on, you know, how they were added because of the contribution. And I think, you know, that the, the point of if, if, if we were to treat all these as sort of sub-projects of Fabric and the Fabric maintainers then become the maintainers for the sub-projects, then that I think would be a, um, I think it would serve to potentially discourage contributions such as this from Secure Key. So, um, because then, you know, in doing so, you're sort of ceding, um, you know, control of the project. Yeah, yeah I, I, was, I was actually looking I, at I it from the opposite perspective that, um, that the, maybe not necessarily the exclusively the maintainers, but kind of more generally the, the community around Fabric is the one that's yeah. more knowledgeable to say the the relative merits of a particular SDK. For example, I see there's there's a little bit of uh, chat that there might be an alternative Go uh, SDK implementation. And so that's where it's it's maybe the having the TSC as as the gatekeeper result. Yeah, I tend to agree. This is Leonard. Um, SDKs can be quite complex in their own merit. 
So as a separate project, independent, but I think closely tied for collaboration with the parent Aren't project. Really the, the most informed uh, set of people to be disciplined. Yes. Wasn't there, uh, this is Vipin, um, wasn't there a uh, STK um, working group proposed and uh, sort of fallen by the, I guess, yeah, it so, didn't really take off. So, right, uh, so, so we, that, that's right, Vipin, we had a, an STK working group and they came up with a specification and then we were going through and thinking about chartering, you know, put, putting together charters for all the working groups, the STK working group felt, well, our job is done here, right? We wrote the spec and everybody's going off and implemented it. Um, so they didn't and, write a spec. Sort of, I'm sorry, hold on, let me just finish, finish uh, Vipin. And so yeah, I yeah. think, you know, the decision a couple of weeks ago was basically to move on, but sort of, if you will, disband the SEK working group. Now, um, with the secure key contribution here and the proposal that, you know, not only do we have a go SEK, but also we start thinking about how it might be extended down the road, then I think that it might be the case that, re, you know, resurrecting the SDK working group to coordinate between Java, Node, Go, and Python uh, SDK uh, projects um, to, you know, coordinate on what the specification was for the SDK um, kind of makes sense again. So um, I, I suspect, you know, and I'll talk with Jim and Morali and, 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 and Troy to figure out, you know, is this something, and Bawa to see if, if this is something that we probably want to sort of resurrect and, and, and move forward with a formal charter and so forth. But Dan's point was, I mean, basically uh, it should be something spanning the different DLTs rather than specific to a certain one. Uh, I mean, I get both points, meaning, you know, if you keep um, everything under sort subsumed under fabric, then uh, we, we may not have multiple maintainers, but at the same time, they also do not get um, uh, any incentive to start supporting other SDKs like Sawtooth Lake, Go SDK, or uh, whatever else. So there has to be a movement also to bring those together because otherwise we are going to have a proliferation. So there has to be uh, some kind of thought put into that, especially in the proposal. Uh, for a you know some kind of a future action, uh, I, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be allowed to uh, be a separate project. All I'm saying is these these thought processes have to be part of um, you know the initial proposal uh, because I've seen several of those projects which was supposed to be spanning uh, other you know other DLTs. Right. Do not do not span because and they don't have a motivation and they don't have, you know, maybe well, maybe because there's no need or whatever. I mean, I, I'm not going to go into that. But well, so uh, here, here's where I sort of you know plug for you know as Brian would call it the duocracy and you know my my perspective is if you have an itch, scratch it, right? Okay. Um, I don't think that we should be in necessarily in the business of trying to sort of force fit, if you will some sort of homogenization of all the different under you know top level DLTs of Aroha, Sawtooth and Fabric. I I am fully supportive of efforts to try and and have them, you know, sort of consolidate to a certain degree, but I don't think it should be forced. I think that if people are interested in driving for uh, and and striving towards um, some sort of a a top level SDK that can indeed satisfy, you know, that, that, that is consistent across all the different DLTs for Hyperledger, that would be a good thing. But somebody's got to put some effort into doing that. There has to be some sort of motivation to actually do that work. Um, and I don't think it's fair necessarily for somebody who's coming in and saying, I have some uh, additional capability that I'd like to bring to the table for, you know, like this Go SDK for Fabric to sort of force them into, well, now you have to do something for everybody. 
Um, you know, I think when we get to the discussion on Composer next, that indeed there is um, a strong potential for that to happen because of its architecture. Um, and but again, it's going to require somebody to actually do some work to make it real. You can't just sort no. of. Well, this Chris, is coming from a Taylor. user's perspective, right? Um, this is coming from a user's perspective, which is proliferation of uh, multiple uh, things all over the place is very difficult to manage for us. Uh, in fact, that is the motivation behind working, uh, working in all these working groups, architecture working yeah. group, identity working group. Uh, so I am proposing that the uh, SDK working group be also resurrected and look at this at least. I mean, not say, okay, don't come into the you know, uh, into the incubation stage, but at least uh, try to bring, you know, uh, this kind of a breadth, breadth into the situation. And uh, that was my uh, message also to uh, Roger um, Stone uh, about uh, Composer. Um, and I'm glad that, you know, they are thinking about this. This is purely a user perspective. So, um, Chris, just the there, there are two issues it feels like to me that are being conflated here. One is um, the the issue of do we require projects to be cross cross platform or um, on that, and and that that just doesn't make any sense to me that we require lip service to to being cross platform. The second the second issue, which I think is the one that Dan's really bringing up, is the question of who has the uh, insight to do an evaluation of. Uh, the details of a particular project. So as more of these projects are becoming more and more specific to platforms, um, uh, we're, we're getting to the point where a subset of us is really the only group that has broad enough knowledge or deep, sorry, deep enough knowledge to actually make a reasonable evaluation of it. Um, and going back to Brian's comment before about, you know, sort of layers of a cake or, or whatever, you know, it, it definitely feels like there's there needs to be at some level a segmentation of these that would allow us to communicate clearly about the positioning of each of these projects, right? So mm -hmm. someone's not going to go to the Go SDK and say, you know, well, why can't I use this for Aroha? Um, they're going to understand that this is something that's extending the functionality out. Um, so I, I completely agree with the uh, distinguishing and separating the maintainers of the projects and the, administra the administrative structure on it. And I also believe we need to find some way of making sure that we're both evaluating and communicating the relationship of these projects to the platforms as well. And, and I don't see that right now. Hey, this is Leonard here. And I think, yeah, I mean, definitely SDKs can be a separate project because there is inherent complexity and it, they have a tight dependence, as you say, with the upstream parent project uh, for which that SDK will serve as a kit, as a development kit. Um, that having been said, from Dippin's point of view, the SDK working group is that body which will do exactly what you just said um, to ensure that we can look at all the different SDK projects as we understand resources the lessons learned from each SDK project and look at the best fit, look at best practices to see how we can standardize that new aspect of development. Um, so I think, yeah, the SDK working group is important to have. It needs to be resourced and most likely it may be resourced from people working on the different projects contributing to the SDKs to start off. But I still think they are complex enough but, um, modules that should stand in their own rights as individual projects, but with tight dependency and collaboration with the parent project. Well, I think that that's sort of a given. Um, so, thanks, Leonard. So, so it, Mick, just back to your point, because I, I was struggling a little bit with trying to understand where you were coming down. So I understood the first point, um, and I think we're aligned on that. I think, though, that the, 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 I guess I guess I'm still not clear in, in terms of establishing this as a project. Are you suggesting that it's not clear enough that this is a fabric specific project, or were you just making a point of? Well, I, I guess I'm I'm not sure on that second point is what I'm saying. 
Um, okay, so I, the, um, part of this is that I'm I'm trying to um, restate what I heard Vipin say, which is you know as somebody. Vipin's comment, as I understood it, is that as somebody who is a user of this, the positioning of the projects and the relationship between them is not obvious. Um, so that, I mean, on the communication side of things, just sort of understanding and communicating the relationship between them just seems like a good thing. That's not a comment about the projects or the quality of the project, right? I'm perfectly happy with the, with the proposal piece of it. Um, my bigger issue is um, I don't really feel qualified to provide feedback on the details of this project because of the level of integration that it has with Fabric. Understood. Okay. Right. That, I mean, that my biggest issue is is that that many of these smaller projects are becoming so specific that for me to really evaluate its 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 usefulness and its intent, I need to be much more deeply involved in the Fabric community. Yeah. Um, at, at a level of engineering that I just don't, I, you know, I'm sorry, I understand your stuff when I talk about it at a high level, but at the level of which I would be able to, or I would be required to evaluate this, I just don't have that background right now. Oh, I understand, okay. I mean, I can read you the document, the document looks fine, right? It looks like a valuable thing. Hey, uh, hey this is Morali from DDCC. Go ahead, Morali, you're very faint though. Is it? Is it better? think so, yes. All right. Yeah, so I've heard Mick and Vipin sort of align with them in terms of, I think, these uh, projects. It's good that we want to share these projects uh, put forth in front, of the, in front of the TSC so that everybody knows that these things are being worked upon with collaboration with other companies. But at the same time, I don't think these need any approvals from a TSC members, right? So, so these should be shared and you know, and and communicated, but not necessarily. These are not necessarily top-level projects which need approvals from TSC members. So, which you know could be the balance that we can strive for. So this is, you know, so so let, let let let's do a couple things here because we're running short on time and we have another two, three things to go through, um, and I'm not sure we'll get to all three, unfortunately. Um, let's, uh, well, let, let's see if we can get a vote on the SDK, and then what I would suggest we do is we tee up some discussion and some, uh, you know, towards a resolution in the next week or two on how to deal with this sort of two levels of stuff, if you will, right, where you have a top level organizing principles such as Sawtooth or Fabric or Aroha and potentially some projects underneath that that people might want to bring to the table and then we have the, the top level and you know do we need to sort of break it break out and have two levels of incubation if you will or two levels of review and so forth or you know maybe we can you know have a discussion about maybe the TSC sort of you know um, uh, if, if somebody's bringing in a project that's specific to Sawtooth or whatever, that they go to those, you know, to the maintainer, the existing maintainers of those projects and, and, and ask their um, sort of ad advice and consent, so to speak, um, on, on the proposal. But um, for now, let's just sort of go through and do the, the Go SDK. And if, if it doesn't pass and we need to have more discussion, I'm happy with that, I guess. Um, but I'd like to try and put it to a vote. I didn't hear anybody sort of saying that they had dif dis disagreement with the proposal or any any fundamental concerns other than maybe not being, you know, as Mick and, and I think Dan were alluding, maybe not deep enough to understand if the proposal is, is sound or not. But um, I, I suggest we just sort of take it to a vote and see where we go from here. Yeah, I agree, Todd. And just one quick question. Do we have a project approval process in place? So if it's deemed a project, it has to go through an approval process, and yeah, that's it's where... Outlined the, the, it's outlined in the, uh, the life cycle. Good. So that's where a lot of the merits of whether it should be a project, how it should be handled, should be agreed on before it is approved as a project. It's got the criteria, and the criteria is outlined in Vipin's proposal template that this one followed.
So Todd, you want to call roll on on the Go SDK, please? Okay, sure thing. <clears throat> uh, ben. Yeah, I, I think from the SDK point of view, I'm fine with it. I'm still looking at the set of items there that require the peers to be modified. Uh, still hesitated right. about that, but you know, in the spirit of the SDK itself, I'm fine. Yes. Okay. Chris? Um, with the same caveat that Ben had, I'm fine with the Go SDK, and obviously the other conversations would have to be had uh, between the other projects. Okay, Dan. Um, so, I, like I put in chat, I think we had a very congenial group, and it's it's uh, uh, uncommon for us to disagree on anything. Uh, in this case, though, I think as a top level project, uh, despite what looks like uh, quality contributions from uh, code and intent, I, I don't think it really serves as a top level project. So, I vote no. Okay, uh, Greg. I so I, I uh, understand all the points of view here. I, I think the SDK is uh, useful. Um, I would want to have further review of some of the details like Ben and Chris had mentioned, and, and I can appreciate the perspective of Dan. So uh, I'm in favor of having the SDK. Um, I, I would be fine if it's a sub-project. I don't know what the mechanism would be to, to approve that or not, so I'm, I'm just going to say yes, but I'm, I'm fine if we want to make it a sub-project. Okay. Hart? Yeah, this, this has been an interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to vote yes with the caveat that we have further discussion on uh, dependent projects. Hey, Nick? Um, hmm. I know that, that okay, and, and as I said before, you know, I can read the document. The document looks fine. Um, I, I just I don't feel qualified to evaluate the nuances even at the I mean even the comments that Chris and Ben just made are things I would not have gotten out of um, uh, out of looking at the document and the, and the description of it um, I, so I guess I'm going to abstain on this one I don't feel qualified at this point to make a sound decision on it okay uh, Morali yeah so um, yes for it but um, like Mick said, I don't believe it's a top-level project that we need to vote on. All right, Shihan. Yes. All right. Oh, so Chris, that's uh, six yes, one no, one abstain. So I, I think that passes. So, um, okay, and, and whether we consider it top-level or sub-project, I think we can, um, I, I, like I said, I, I'm going to suggest I, I tee up a conversation around that so that we can actually have, um, you know, an articulated policy. Because I, I, I definitely appreciate Dan and, and Mick's position on this. And I would feel similar, you know, if, if somebody came in and said, hey, I want to start a top-level project for some you know, uh, Ruby SDK for, for Sawtooth or something. Well, yeah, and and I and by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see some things like, you know, especially with the architecture that Dan's doing, you're going to see projects like we want to do the um, the Go-based uh, transaction family engine yeah. for right. Sawtooth. A and are you comfortable evaluating that? That would be my question. Yeah, I, I think it's exactly to your point. And so, you know, I, I, again, I think, you know, maybe it comes down to, you know, and, and, and again, I, I, you know, I, 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 was, I, was, I was going more for, well, I don't want to sort of just have the Fabric team start up projects or sub-projects and seems, you know, as if they're going around the process. Um, I didn't want that either. And so, again, I think it's worthwhile that we as a TSC come to an agreement on what this process should be and how it should be managed consistently across the, the various top-level projects um, that that we add. So uh, I'll, I'll take that conversation off after after the call here. So let's let's move on. on 
No, I'm just going to say, Leonard, here, that um, Vipin, that supports Vipin's point in resurrecting the uh, SDK working group because a lot of that might come onto their domain. So, thank yes. you. Yes, I agree. Okay, so quickly, because we're really running on the time here. So, um, Simon, are you on? Hi, yes, on the head. Simon, great. You want to um, go through the composer proposal? And um, somebody sure. will the chat. I'll put the link in the chat. There you there go. go. Okay. Okay, um, so for those of you that haven't seen it, um, Fabric Composer, or Composer for short, is um, a layer of abstraction that we've been working on for a little while. Um, and it's a layer or a framework that sits on top of a blockchain or distributed ledger technology. So we're not we're not implementing another blockchain or DLT technology as part of this work. Um, and we built it as a result of um, some work that we've done working with lots of clients around a solution built on top of Fabric. Um, and from that work, we identified that there are a lot of common elements to all of these solutions. Um, or business networks as we saw it. We, we see a lot of work around modeling uh, blockchain solutions using assets, participants, identities, transactions, and registries. And it, it's very difficult to take those business concepts um, from a real world business problem and map them down into underlying uh, blockchain code. And it's quite a difficult transition to go through that work. Um, so the motivation of the Composer project has been to accelerate that development process and providing, by providing a layer of abstraction that allows business analysts and application developers to model their business network and implement it at that level without having to worry about the underlying technology so much. Um, and um, we're hoping that this will quickly expand the number of uh, blockchain solutions that are out there. So any, any questions on that before I continue? Oh, okay, um, so if I start going through um, our, our sort of main component. Um, so we, we built a um, modeling language, a custom modeling language that allows um, uh, hopefully all kinds of different developers to model their business problems. Um, you can model it at the business level so you can describe the structure of an asset or a participant uh, and you can model relationships between assets and participants and transactions as well. We have the ability to uh, encode business logic uh, as transaction processor functions, and you can do that in standard JavaScript code. Um, and we picked JavaScript because it's really quite a popular modern programming language uh, that is used by many developers around the world. Uh, we've, um, we've implemented declarative access control using access control lists. And those rules uh, allow a developer to define uh, what resources can be accessed by which participants and we automatically enforce those rules um, without the user having to write any access control code. We have some clients of administrative APIs um, in Node.js only at the moment um, but we're not, we're not strictly tied to that. Uh, that allows developers to build applications around the business network running on, the, running on Fabric. We have a web-based playground tool. Um, there's a bunch of links at the bottom to all of this, by the way, uh, that allows new users to come along to Composer, start modeling a business network, learn the language, test it out, all from the safety of their web browser. And something we've, we've done that we're quite proud of, really, um, is the ability to run all of the code in browser without having to connect it to a real Fabric instance. So we can take our client code and our runtime code and run it in a JavaScript engine inside the browser. Um, because in a lot of cases when people are coming along to this and wanting to model their business problem, they don't really need uh, that underlying technology until they're ready to, to go a bit further with it. To start rolling it out, start doing a bit of testing. Um, we're looking into REST API support um, using the loopback framework so we can generate um, business-centric REST APIs from the model of a business network. Um, and we have a loopback connector that provides that. Uh, we're looking at ways to plug into editors. Um, so we've got Atom and Visual Studio Code plugins that are very new. But, um, they just do syntax highlighting at the moment, but we have some ideas about how they could be expanded. 
And we're also looking at application generation using the Omen framework to sort of give a app dev a bit of a boost up and get them up and running so we can generate, we can take the model of a business network, generate a, a basic but functional Angular 2 application that any skilled UI developer could take and morph into a proper designed uh, application. And so um, everything I just went through has been open source. We did that in, at the end of January, just before the Hackfest in San Francisco. Um, it's on our Fabric Composer repository, and uh, part of this proposal is to move all of that code into the Hyperledger project. Um, we're considering some, some big work at the moment. Um, we're looking at first-class support for events, um, so events outbound from a business network, so if something happens, the blockchain, an asset gets traded or created, then I want an event and I want to be able to hook that into my existing business processes. Uh, we're interested in links between different business networks, so having one business network running on one fabric and another business network running on another fabric and allowing them to communicate with each other and share assets and participants across those networks. Um, we're interested in complex query support as well, so being able to do both historical and complex queries over assets and participants that are recorded on a blockchain. And one of the other things we're interested in is if the community are, is investigate adding support for the other uh, uh, distributed ledger technologies under the Hype Ledger project, so our Rohart and Sorty Flake. Um, as, as I mentioned, we have support for running standalone in the web browser and to make that possible, we built an abstract and an adapter layer into Composer that, that makes it possible to switch out the bits of code that deal with Fabric or, in that case, the web browser. So that there is definitely a strong possibility that we could look at um, moving that to the other distributed ledgers. Um, so in the how-to, we've got links to all our public documentation, our GitHub repos. Uh, our issue tracker as well, um, and we also do a, a lot of automatic builds and publishing to NPM and Docker Hub, uh, including a, a public instance of the playground on Bluemix. Um, and uh, we're holding a call next Thursday. Um, it's on our wiki. I think I included it in the. Oh, maybe I included it in the mail for the mailing list. Um, it's, it's next Thursday. Um, and it's a sort of an introduction to Composer, so I appreciate it. not everyone's seen it, and so we've got an hour-long call to go through it in, in detail. So any questions? I have several. This looks really, really interesting. Um, so let me just make sure that I understand sort of positioning, how this, this fits in. So there are a number of kind of contracting languages that are coming out, IV, DAML, and some others like that. Um, this feels like the beginnings of a platform independent contract language. Would, would that be a, a, an, an appropriate positioning for it? I think so, yes. Um, so currently we've only looked at, at Fabric support, but yes, it could definitely be platform independent. In fact, the code is, I would say, 90% platform independent as it is today. And, and architecturally, you have the, the adapter that would allow you to, to map it down. I mean, the, the, okay, we I wouldn't be surprised if semantics kind of bleed through because this is where we start from. But architecturally, your description looks, I mean, it looks like you've, you've it architected in a way it could be adapted down. Uh, so I guess my question is really that the specification language that you have that, um, at the top, um, how uh, Yeah, it's is, a modeling uh, language. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you very do um, shall I show you? Can I share my screen? Would that be That's probably the easiest way? It, it, and I asked because I was looking problem. earlier for some example. I was just looking earlier for some examples. The only one I could find was in the tutorial, which is really simplistic. Okay. Um, so, can you see my screen? Okay, um, so we do have some very basic examples, but we've been look, looking at working uh, on creating various sample business networks that are stored on GitHub. Um, is it going to work? Yeah.
It's getting there. Sorry, slow network this end. Um, so this is a, a list of sample business networks that we built so far. Um, so the one that showed at the hack. Hackfest was the car auction business network. I don't know if you've seen that, but we've got one around financial bonds, uh, one around digital property, which is the one from our Getting Started guide. We have our favorite models uh, trading sample. Um, a new one around perishable good tracking. I'll just open up the uh, perishable goods one. So, so Simon, this is Chris. We're, um, we're running out of time and we're losing a couple of oh, sorry. ESC members here. Um, so what I would suggest is we pick this up um, next week. Um, and you mentioned there was a call on Monday to go over this in more depth. Is that right? Uh, no, it's a Thursday call, so it's actually after next week's TSC meeting. Oh, after. Oh, that's kind of late. <laughs> um, okay. Um, uh, well, that's fine. Well, we'll pick it up next week. Um, and, you know, I think everybody... Um, you know, please do feel free to sort of follow up on the mailing list. Um, uh, with uh, any, yeah, any any questions, please give me a shout. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure the team would be happy to to respond. And um, you know, do take uh, an opportunity to to go and check it out and kick the tires if you have any specific questions. Um, and uh, so I think, and apologies to um, Dan and Mick um, on the sawtooth uh, demo. Uh, net discussion and uh, to Tomash if he was on for the continued GSL discussion, but uh, we're at end of job and a little bit over time actually. So uh, thanks again, everyone, and we'll pick it up again next week. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.